welcome to all you guys that are on right now. And I'm glad uh, we have so many people on our, uh, uh, you know, upcoming boot yeah, that we're doing this time. Uh, for, for those of you that haven't had any sessions with me at any of our previous annual conferences, my name is John Gillum. I am a real estate broker licensed in several states. I do residential, ranch, and commercial. Uh, and I'm also a, a national real estate instructor. I travel the country. I work with real estate brokers. Um, and I teach about 120, 140 classes a year. So, you know, I, I, I'm in front of a lot of different people. I get to hear a lot of the situations that they have going on. And all of my classes are geared around core competencies and issues that come up during transactions. And obviously, inspection is a big part of that. I've been partnering with InterNACHI for several years uh, as an instructor for both real estate and uh, inspectors to, uh, to be able to, you know, kind of address some of these things and sort of bridge some of those gaps. I know that in some areas, we have a lot of um, breakdowns in, you know, the real estate side, understanding the services that, that you guys are doing in a, in a functional way. Um, but I also think, you know, that sometimes because we have that disconnect, we're, we're, there's just a lot of misunderstandings and like how we do things and what our processes are. And so, you know, the, what I've done with InterNACHI is worked to try to bridge some of those gaps and maintain those connections. Um, and, and unfortunately, when we hit COVID and some of the things that are coming up, it sort of stumped a lot of that and then stopped a lot of the communication that we had. But what it's also done is it's opened the door for a lot of really creative ways of doing business differently, um, doing things in, in some ways that we found that can be really effective and actually reducing liability, providing better services for your consumers and opening some opportunities for you guys to actually be able to maintain and continue connections that may not have existed in the past. I know I've worked with a lot of you guys that have been doing inspections for, for many, many years. Um, you know, and, and I know you guys have seen a lot of the changes in, in the technology that we have. And, a, and one of the harder parts is really trying to keep up and figure out like what are the most effective tools that we use um, and I know you guys, especially when we have our live conferences, uh, you know, we have all of our vendors there and there's a lot of amazing tools, whether it's the report tool that you guys are using, um, you know, are, are you using infrared cameras, just, you know, moisture sensors, what are the services you're providing? And we sometimes forget that there's other tools available to us, which are the connection tools um, beyond just email, beyond texting, um, beyond Facebook. And so I want to really sort of look at that and we're going to do that by jumping into a few different topics today um, and looking at how we approach the business um, from a few different perspectives. So I want to kind of start by looking at how we set our first, our first impressions, what we're doing to separate ourselves from our competition. One of the big things I want to focus on with that is making sure that our focus is on us. I think it's important for you guys to know your competition, to know what they do, to know what their services are, what their pricing is, sort of what the market will bear. Um, but when you're marketing, the, the, the focus really should be on what you're doing for yourself to separate yourself off from the competition, um, not really, uh, you know, speaking to them um, or about them in a negative way, but really trying to boost yourself up. Uh, we're going to look at how we can do some different things in marketing in our social distance world, um, ways that you guys can actually continue to make virtual connections and then continue those customer relations and I think that the technology that we have now is opening the door for you guys to, to build stronger ongoing relationships and have more contact with the people that you've worked with moving forward in ways that we've just never really had before. And we're also going to look at some, uh, some other tools that, that I see a lot of customers um, that they really appreciate, which especially right now, again, in, in our COVID time of doing virtual walkthroughs. Um, and having video archives along with the written summaries of what, of those virtual walkthroughs for the summaries. Um, and one of the things that we're finding is it actually saves a lot of time for the inspectors and it creates a, a safe and a really good um, environment because we're not waiting for the consumers to come to the property. That way the, the broker doesn't have to be there when the consumers are there. We're not putting too many people in the home. Um, and it's allowing you guys to really hone in and focus on what you're doing and then be able to point things out to them in, in really specific ways. Um, and then it also sort of opens the door for them to call and ask questions. We'll talk about some of the ways to continue to engage the consumer um, after, the, after the inspection. So some of the things, again, to think about on your first impression is what is that impression when you do meet them in person? Um, you know, I think that how we present ourselves is really, really important. The, uh, the um, how you uh, 
describe what your services are, what information you can provide to them, even you know the, the box of books that we have of now that you've had your inspection, those are things that, my, that I get those from my clients, even as a broker, whether the inspector provides it or not, just because it's something that it helps them to really understand a lot of the services around the property. Um, and, and just at, when you're coming in, sort of establishing your value and, and setting that comfort level, as well as being able to engage the person so you can sort of see what their personality type is. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have found that there are some consumers that really want to engage and talk, and that's how they, that's how they um, process information is sort of through the engagement and, and in that conversation. You have a lot of them where they're not really conversational and they just want a list, like they just want the list of stuff and how they need, how they need to process forward with it. So, you know, you guys being able to, to read different people, um, I would recommend services like, um, you know, Angel Tucker is, is a, a, she's a personality specialist. I know it sounds kind of strange in our industries to do that, but actually knowing how to read people so that you can communicate things effectively will raise the value of your services and your reviews and, and the comfort level that people have with you. The virtual side of it, I think, is going to be the area where we're going to spend a lot of time today on what you're doing to establish that first impression for you there. And that might be, do you have a YouTube page? Are you doing things on Instagram or Facebook? Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of inspectors that are using other services that they're getting onto different forums. They've got um, uh, TikTok pages. You know, they're doing little, little short, uh, you know, brief um, informational things in there. And those are great just because you have the ability of continuing to maintain contact with consumers and you can do a lot of education and become a resource for them. And those are the things that we're going to do to have you continue to establish value, regardless of who the consumer is that we're trying to contact. And really, at the end of the day, what we want to look at is, is that bottom line question of why should I use you? That's I, I think that's always going to be the biggest, uh, the biggest question that we have from a buyer perspective, seller perspective, the escrow attorneys in the states that use those um, is, is really what is it that we're doing? So we're going to kind of walk through a few different topics here. We're going to look at uh, who you're marketing to um, when you're looking at the realtor side, um, when you're trying to establish those new relationships or continuing prior relationships, working with the realtor boards as an affiliate member. Um, those are all going to be really crucial for a lot of you guys that want to have that ongoing business and, and have seen the value of being tied into and, and having a really strong referral network with, with the brokers. But understanding our role as it ties into your role will actually provide you an opportunity to become a much stronger resource for us because a lot of brokers and agents and realtors don't truly understand what the inspection is supposed to do. And, and it's, so it's mishandled on our side which creates liability and it creates problems. And I think you guys have a lot of opportunity to step in and become uh, educators and resources and supports for us to do a better job for our consumers, which when you're that kind of a person for me, I'm going to lean on you and, and make sure that you're always top of mind when I'm sending out my referrals to my customers. Um, a lot of you guys are in escrow states where you have attorneys. Uh, so if, if you're like in Chicago or uh, you know, different parts of the country like that. The escort attorneys are often the ones who might be making the referrals, especially for the 40% of sales that don't use real estate brokers. So we want to make sure that you guys are reaching out to the folks on that, uh, on that side. We'll walk a little bit through engaging buyers, having that value proposition for buyers and sellers, um, staying in contact with previous customers, and, and really kind of building your business with current homeowners as well. So on the realtor side, um, I think a big part of it is really understanding what the broker's role is. Um, and again, this kind of varies state to state, but you know, typically our job is to bring the, the different services together for the buyer and or the seller to make sure that we're getting as much information to the consumers as possible. And this has changed significantly. If you, for any of you guys that have been doing this for a, for a really long time, um, you'll probably remember in, in the late 80s, the inspection industry was not anything close to what it is right now, not just because of the services, but because of the relationship that a lot of brokers had and the sellers had and how we worked it. Inspections typically weren't um, uh, recommended because everybody was working as a seller's agent. And so, you know, I wouldn't be recommending services that could potentially damage my seller. Whereas now we have a lot of laws around disclosure and um, misrepresentations and allowing buyers to get discovery. And so that's why there's such a strong pull by the real estate community to lean on you guys and to make sure that we have inspectors that are 
you know, becoming more thorough. I know we had a lot of issues before where brokers were not wanting certain inspectors because you guys were deal killers. Well, we're actively changing that perception to where we want you folks that are really thorough, doing a really good job, offering a lot of services and actually bringing out all the information so that both consumers are actually protected better. So we're discovering that our liability is reduced when we have a really good, strong um, inspector on the back side. So that's really helping to build your value. The things that that brokers are looking for on that side, and and what I'm I want to go through this because I want you guys to sort of have this list. So when you're presenting your value sets in a Facebook post, if you have TikTok, if you're putting something out there, whatever the format is, um, when you're putting out there, you can kind of make sure that that you can key in on these on these topics. Um, so that you'll 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 be touching on the the phrases that we're looking for as brokers, but you know having really good thorough inspections um, is is getting to be more and more crucial. We're seeing a lot of people who don't want just the cursory inspections. We really want you guys to have as many um, uh, tools available to you so that the buyer is really getting as much information as possible, or even on the pre inspection that the seller is getting as much information as possible. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues that come up with pre inspections uh, in a little bit. Uh, having really good communication. Our industry is, is fraught with problems where the brokers don't fully understand things. We're trying to communicate it to the buyers and sellers, and we don't get it ourselves. There's some breakdowns there. We don't always have great communication with the inspectors so that you know we can make sure that the buyer is um, uh, you know getting, getting really good information as we go through there. Um, to make sure that they're protected. And, and, and again, this is, that, that's going to be a really big part. Um, the, uh, and so again, just, just that communication, but we're also wanting to drive the communication between you and the consumer and less between you and the, uh, the broker. And I think that's going to be a big part of what we can do. Um, and we're also going to look at some dangers of those conversations as well. Um, I always think that it's great when you guys can not just discuss additional tests, like rather than just saying, well, we can do radon or we can check for asbestos or we can, but to actually explain why those things could be important, not just for health and safety for the people, which is the primary reason, but also helping them understand that whatever they're not looking into now could be a liability for them when they go to sell in the future. And so again, the perspective is changing significantly in our industries. Um, when, I, when I say stay in your lane, one of the areas that I know a lot of the inspectors that I work with, and, and when I'm working with Internachi, one of the things they hear consistently is how frustrating it is to have the broker step in and say, oh, well, that's pretty common here. Oh, well, that's pretty normal here. Oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. And I'm trying to get brokers to shut the hell up, to be, to be blunt, like we need to stay in our lane. But on that same token, I want to make sure that, you know, when we're going through this, that, you know, we're also understanding and respecting what the inspection is doing for us and helping us to identify the red flag so we can get further investigation. Um, and where we have problems that is when inspectors will come back and say, well, I think you should be negotiating this or asking for this or doing that when there might already be other issues in the transaction that you guys wouldn't be privy to. Um, and, and it can cause some confusion, just like we should not be, you know, making comments about the seriousness or, uh, you know, what's going on with things during inspection. We should not be dismissing things that, that you say. Um, the, uh, and, and again, a big part of it is educating clients. So we're not here to try to scare them away from the deal. We want to make sure that they're educated so they understand all of the aspects of the property. Uh, being timely, I, I think that goes for all of us. Brokers need to be, be more cognizant of that. Um, having our inspectors be timely with what they're doing and when you guys are going to respond back with reports is really crucial. Um, and I'm going to, we'll get to your questions in just a second. Um, being prepared. I can't tell you guys how many times I have had inspectors that have parts of the inspection that were completed because um, they didn't have, uh, they, and I'm going to talk about this on the dislikes too, but when you're prepared, those are really good things. When you're not prepared, if you don't have a ladder and you can't access the, the attic, when your stuff's not charged, um, and so things are just left off of the inspection, that, that's not a great situation for us to deal with, especially in markets where a lot of our sellers are, are not allowing a lot of opportunity to, uh, to come back and get further investigation or to have you guys come back again. Um, having photos and videos with good quality. I will tell you guys that you know a lot of you are relying on um, older generation iPads or older phones, um, and the, the photo quality, I'm sorry, is not that great. And the video quality is even worse. And so when you're trying to point things out and show it, 
it's really difficult to, for us to be able to have that information so that the consumers can take it onto the next level, which is going to be the contractor, the plumber, the electrician, to really be able to see what some of those areas are that you've seen. Because I've had a lot of those cases where you'll point out and say, oh, well, there's a, you know, a, a crack in the roof truss, or there's a problem with this. And, and the picture doesn't really point enough out. And, and again, I know a lot of you guys are doing really well with that. Um, but we still have a lot of folks in our industry that just that aren't. Um, again, I've already talked about timely reporting. That's really, really crucial for us, especially right now in the markets where a lot of our sellers are shortening the time frame for us to get our things done. And what we're trying to remember and teach is that we're wanting to have your inspection done as soon as possible in the transaction. So I know the information that I need to go to um, for further investigation. Do I need to bring in the structural engineer? Do I need to get the electrician? Do I need to get the roofer? And I don't, you know, we might not have that information until we get your inspection. And so if we're waiting on the inspection or if there's a delay in being able to get you guys out there, then we're often running out of time to bring in that second level of investigation from the other qualified folks to, to get bids on that, which is then impacting the transaction and creating more liability for everybody. Um, having really good summaries, I'm going to go into that a little bit. You know, for years, we've always had really good, strong um, written summaries. I know a lot of you guys have actually gone to a format where you have a completely separate written summary, which is a great tool, especially in some of the states where they've actually uh, prohibited or, or, or limited uh, inspections being given to the listing side, which is actually a protection for you guys. Like the buyer orders it, they get it, you get the summary, the buyer has the entire inspection, um, and then maybe the seller will just get the summary, but not the whole inspection, which, which is a protection for you guys and a protection for your intellectual property. Um, clarifying defect versus maintenance. I've had a lot of situations where we've had buyers and sellers get crossed with one another over something that's a, a deferred maintenance issue. It's something that the buyer should understand is something they're going to have to do on a regular basis and that it's not, you know, a, a primary issue right now. It's something that they might need to do right now, but it should be something that should kill the transaction. So, um, and then the other one is sending the information to the client, not to the broker, right? We're not the, we should not be the ones walking through the inspection and deciding what's important and not important because we're not qualified to do that. You know, again, us staying in our lane, making sure that we're relying on you guys to do the services that you're really good at um, is a part of why we probably shouldn't be getting inspections and having us read through it unless the consumer comes in and says, hey, these are the things that, uh, you know, that Fletcher, that James said, you know, are really important. I want to make sure that we can address those, um, you know, at, as, as I go forward. And then we can either work together or we can reach out and have, you know, the, the further investigation with those things. And that's where also having a list of resources gets to be really important. Some of the things that we, uh, that we struggle with is telling consumers what to negotiate without having actual bids, um, especially right now. Um, one of the dangers, I know a lot of you guys have some really amazing tools for, um, for getting bids with some of the, the services you have, but I think we're seeing a lot of problems where pricing is fluctuating so much right now and the time frame of getting things done is fluctuating so much right now that a lot of the bidding programs that we have to get bids for that, that you guys are providing, aren't as accurate as what they used to be. So we're, again, that's kind of a big struggle. Um, speaking without having tests, I can't tell you guys how frustrating it is when I go through and I have a, a um, more green or less experienced uh, in, in inspector come out and be like, oh, well, you know, I, I noticed that there's a lot of mold up in this area and I'm standing 10 feet back, just kind of being present, but trying not to engage and like that'll cue me. And I'll be like, oh, damn, that's awesome. Like you've already, you, I don't know, like where you pulled an inspection out of to, you know, actually get the mold tested, but that's pretty awesome. If you could just like reach up some orifice and pull out a full mold report right now. Um, and we all know that that's not the case. And so a part of it is, you know, making sure that we're we're driving people to get the investigation and not making assumptions of, of what's always there. Um, missing things due to distraction. I know some of you guys are fine with having the consumer there with you during the inspection. One of the things that I kind of appreciate about COVID is that that's happening less. So you can focus on what you're doing and we have less issues of things being missed because the consumer distracted you in the middle of something and then pulled you into a different direction. Um, where he talked about not being prepared, having handwritten reports. I know we saw some folks that do that and it just makes that it makes it hard. Um, we still have a lot of issues of inspectors breaking things during the inspection. Um, and I know there's, there's certain levels of invasiveness that we can and can't do, but we just wanna make sure that the buyer understands the liability they take on before you guys start you know, doing invasive type 
of inspections. Um, and then also sending a report to the listing broker um, and speaking to the broker rather than the client. Those are things um, I do not, as, as a listing broker, I don't want to get your inspections. And honestly, I don't think it's always appropriate to send them to the listing broker unless that is something that is required by your state. And I know some of you guys with uh, you know um, inspection licenses, which not every state has, um, those are going to be some areas where uh, you know it, it can be a bit of a struggle because you're required to provide it to the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and, oh, and the last one I've already said this, verbalizing anything and not putting it in writing. That's going to be a major issue um, as, as we go forward. You know, when you guys verbalize, say, this is something you should get more investigation of, and not putting it in writing gives us zero ground to work on with that. Um, so Brenda, I'm going to go ahead and address some of the questions really quick, and then we'll jump back into the slideshow. Okay. Uh, let me scroll down here. And just a comment, I think probably what a lot of the attendees are thinking, I've yet to see a realtor or broker not see me as a deal killer. So I'm trying to teach them that I've never killed a deal, but I have had houses commit suicide. Restraining our realtors is difficult. Lower our standards is unacceptable. Right, and so let me so so let me go ahead and address that really quick with James. Um, I, I agree, and again, we're actually trying to change in our industry how we view that um, and, and really sort of getting us to realize that the services you guys perform are a protection for the consumer. And one of the big things I push is that having an inspection that kills the deal is actually a good thing. Um, if, if there's problems with the property that the buyer isn't going to want to deal with or take on, then they shouldn't be buying that property. That's the whole reason why we're trying to make sure that they see the value of the inspection. So, but again, that's a huge shift in the mindset that we have to have as brokers, but a lot of that is going to come from the relationships that we have with you guys when we start learning more about how, how we all get sued when the buyer has a problem, especially in the market right now, where they're moving through things so quickly, and then four years from now when the market's different, and they're mad because the house isn't worth as much, or they're finding issues that they didn't know about, and they're pissed about it, and they're looking for something to blame. Right, so that's a big part of it, and I think that that shift is is changing. So, um, and and you're right, there there are properties that buyers should not be getting into. That's that's an absolute fact for it. Um, so, so how the do we uh, get into our realtors' offices as a welcome guest to train our realtors that we're in uh, that we're an asset, not a liability. So again, a part of that conversation is, you know, when you're talking about the services you're providing, um, I think it's great when you come and say, hey, these are the things that we're doing in our industry. These are new tools that we have. Um, but I think if you can actually work from the perspective of the broker a little bit or, or the realtor and saying, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, you guys are really clear in, in our state how we're functioning through the inspection, what the process is. Um, you know, to, to better protect your consumers, whether it's the buyer or the seller. And we want to make sure that you guys understand why we don't say certain things like, you know, as an inspector, why would I not say oh, that's a settlement crack or why would I not call something mold? You know, why do we have different terminology that we use so that the, the and because brokers say this stuff all the time, like I see real estate brokers comment on structural issues or they comment on, you know, roofing issues. And, and we make, we make, statements of things, a fact that we have no knowledge of what we actually should be saying. And so I think if you can come in and say, hey, I want to work with you guys and help you to sort of understand some of the terminology and why we do things, because that might help you not have as many mis misrepresentations reduce your liability. Now you're saving me, right? That, that's a good thing for us. Um, so James also promoting pre-inspection certified homes, um, not gaining traction because the market's yeah, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. New home inspections are a struggle. We have a lot of our new home builders that are actually prohibiting them from being done. Um, they're also going to have a lot of issues coming back because a lot of our states that have the, the one-year implied warranty, um, what I'm going to really, really recommend to you guys is if you're in an area where builders are not really supporting or even allowing um, outside third-party inspectors to come in, is offer a post-inspection um, negotiate into the deal or work with the brokers and say, hey, like, you know, let me come out and do a post inspection. I'll come out two weeks or four weeks. They've moved in. We can check the fittings to make sure everything is working. I'll, you know, I'll go through the house and then maybe even offer, and, and you'll see this in a little bit, maybe even offer like an, a, an 11 month inspection to come back out to see if there's anything that's come up because in most states, there's an implied one year warranty on the, on the workmanship. And so 
you know, there's ways of working around that, even if we can't really build in what we're doing um, on some of those, but even again, doing that even on your pre-inspections, I think having the pre-inspection and then doing it that you might do for the seller. Um, and if you're in Washington or, or uh, Denver or some of those areas, we're doing a lot of pre-inspections for buyers so that they can go through the transaction without having the inspection as, as a contingency anymore. Um, but I, I still think that having the post-inspection is not a bad thing just for them to be able to get a little bit more information on the things that they needed to be aware of. Um, so any other questions from you? Oh, sorry, I got a little bit more. Inspection is supposed to be uh, non-invasion visual inspection ever using normal controls, not working, breaking the control. Yeah, um, so again, you guys are kind of commenting on sort of the, the invasive versus non-invasive. And that's where we start having issues is, you know, like a, a lot of um, you know, again, it's just it's some of the, the, the techniques that we have, um, you know, but I've, I've been in situations where like the inspector will show the screwdriver going through the rotten wood and then the seller is mad because you did something that they're considering invasive. Um, so how we can work through some of our tools to do that and, 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 and leverage that might be good. Uh, Scott was saying, I'd love for realtors to understand why we only uh, open a representative number of windows and check outlets. Our time for the sake of all involved is very critical find the get it done in three hours. Um, so yeah, Scott, one of the, I, I struggle with, and I've had deals where the sellers have said, your inspector can come in for an hour or your inspector can come in for three hours. It, honestly, the, the size of the home, the condition of the home, I tell my buyers, like there's not one set fee. There's not one set price. The more that we want to have them look into, the more it's going to be. Um, but I'm also one who tells my buyers, like you should be planning on, on spending between $1,500 and $2,000 as a part of your inspection. Now, uh, the first chunk of that is gonna be 450 or 550 or 850, whatever it is for the general inspection you guys do. And then the balance is gonna be either for the add-on services of uh, radon, asbestos, water, septic, um, whatever it might be, as well as also knowing that they that the only way for them to truly get contractors out there, that licensed contractors out there, is to pay them for their time. So I let them know, it's like, you're gonna to wanna to set money aside for a sewer scope. You're going to set money aside to pay the plumber or to pay the roofer to actually come out and do it so that they're motivated to come here. So that's a big part of it, um, but making sure that they have the time to get it done and that the sellers understand the time to get it done. Because the bottom line, one of the things I want you guys to sort of start presenting as, as a resource for us, and again, and you can do this, and I want you guys, as we're having this conversation, I want you guys to think, how can I do this in an online setting so you're not having to repeat it a thousand times? What can you do to create a video segment, to have a post, to put something informational out about there? You can rely on the realtor industry. You can call somebody like me. We can provide you guys information or help you out with that so that you can get it out to a thousand people or, or 20,000 people in your market and say, listing brokers, you probably don't want to have a seller who's rushing the inspection because if the inspector doesn't have the opportunity to discover things for the buyer and the seller misses that in their representations on their seller's private disclosure form, your seller is still on the hook for that. If there's any misrepresentation or something that the seller may have forgotten about that the buyer might be able to prove that they had knowledge of, your seller would still be liable for that. So you guys having the opportunity to really do your jobs well is actually a protection for the seller. In these situations. So again, it's, it's a very different mindset that we have to get into. Um, when the pushback is you are paid for it all, though I find a tactful answer, especially realtors. Um, and, and yes, yeah, Scott, I mean, like I said, it's luxury, not luxury. You know, we're always going to find that in, as we get into more affordable homes where people don't have down payments, don't have money, we're really limiting on what they can do for the level of inspection. If I'm doing a commercial deal, if it's a 10, 15, $20 million commercial deal, we're spending 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars on due diligence and inspections. If it's a you know ninety thousand dollar house and the people are coming in with no money down on a on a USDA deal and they just have no money, that that's the reality of it. So we do have to sort of go around that, uh, but we still want to make sure that they understand the value in what you're doing. Uh, trends in all markets have been to forego the inspections, make offers more appealing, liability put the broken the agents um, to be sued. Many years understand this, and Gregory, that is that is exactly why. I'm wanting to have this conversation. I, one of the classes I have approved through Nanachi, one of the classes I teach in multiple states is having brokers understand that the lack of inspection by the buyer, okay, the lack of the buyer's opportunity to get an inspection creates a liability for the seller. 
because then the buyer's purchasing, purchasing the property solely based on the seller's representations and the broker's disclosures of what we saw when we happened to, to do our walkthrough. When we drive that through to the brokers on the other side, you will see listing brokers who will actually counter back and build in an inspection period and say, no, we're not going to waive inspections. You're going to get an inspection and you can terminate and go away. Like we might not negotiate, but you're going to get an inspection done. And so having that value is going to be, it, again, comes from you guys to help us, um, you know, to, to, for us to have a lot less liabilities we go through too. So um, we had one in the q and I never... Uh, never make referrals to trades be a perspective of conflict of interest. Uh, so some of you are saying that that you guys don't always like having um, referrals to trades people. And, and I don't disagree with it. It's the same issue we have. We actually have a federal law, um, RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, that really puts a huge liability on us for how we make referrals. That includes to you guys, but you still want us to make referrals to you. And a part of it is, is what is the service that we're doing? So what I do is I don't make recommendations necessarily, but I will provide a list of resources. And so if you're on my list of resources, um, I'll have your, your contact information, your website, but I also like to know what your qualifications are so that when I'm providing to the client, I can say they've been this for 10 years, they've done that for 20 years, they're a master certified inspector, um, they've got these 15 certifications or this much, this much experience, they're bonded, they're insured, here's what they're coming for. Um, you know, so that when the consumer talks with you, they also know like what are the other things that you're certified to test for um, so that we can maybe wrap up more things. So that's when I talk about providing resources, that's what I'm looking for on that aspect of, um, you know, having sort of a list of people out there. But you can be really clear in saying these are simply resources of people that, that I know can provide this in the area. They might be able to get it done timely, um, but I can't speak to the level of work that they're going to do. And I'm not going to take on liability if, if they miss something because that's, that's honestly one of the issues that we have on the real estate side is when you guys, when if I refer you primarily um, to go over there. So it's like, Jeff, Jeffrey, you're asking a question. If, if, I, if I send somebody directly to you and you're the one I say, well, this is, this is my person. That's the one that I like to do all my stuff for. And you miss something, I'm liable for that under negligent referral. The fact that you guys are Internachi members is a huge benefit for you. And again, something to market. So when you're talking to a broker, you can say, if I miss something that the consumer ends up coming after you for, for a negligent referral claim, we're actually going to, we as InterNACHI members, um, InterNACHI will indemnify you up to $10,000 of those legal expenses, which most of us as brokers have, have insurance to cover that. And so it'll cover our deductible. That's one of the reasons I love working with InterNACHI inspectors is because you guys reduce my liability. If you don't know that, you can't market that. So you guys should also know kind of what, what your services are to go through. Uh, I spent three and a half hours uh, going over to my phone in the basement for three major issues. Client told realtor I was wasting time. Should have. Uh, yeah, I, again, these are these are uh, <laughs> these are things that come up, and sellers are always going to have a lot more issue, especially as you find things wrong. Um, and and again, like we get new construction where we all know that they're cutting corners, or we get fix and flips where. They're doing everything they can to just come in and and you know make it look pretty, um, and it's and it's, it's it's just lipstick on a pig, and the house is still a piece of crap. So that's definitely uh, definitely see something. Um, the questions I'm answering are in the uh, are in the chat. So one of them was actually in the Q and A section, not in the chat. Other so um, so that's all I'm getting to. I'm just I'm just kind of going through the questions that are coming up in the chat that you just posted in Heather. So, uh, so you might need to click on chat, but let's go ahead and go back to the back to the slideshow. Um, so again, just some things for you guys to be aware of. And every state is different in how we handle our disclosures and and what comes up. Um, in as as realtor members, which is I, I want you guys to clarify, there is a difference between a realtor and a licensed uh, real estate broker, agent, salesperson. Um, as realtors, we're actually bound to a separate ethical standard um, to, to that, that, that puts us in a, in a higher level of responsibility and a higher level of liability for what we're disclosing to our consumers. Um, now, again, states always have requirements about material defect, what we have actual knowledge of. And a part of that is also realizing now that um, a lot of states are saying that if the broker worked with the buyer when they bought the property and then five years later, I'm helping them sell the property, if that inspection was passed through me, I have knowledge of what's that in inspection. So even if the seller 
which was previously the buyer, doesn't have that, I should probably still have it to provide back to the seller so that they can make full disclosure of the information. Otherwise, I'm on the hook for that. So they're really coming down hard on the real estate side of it for our liability and the disclosure side. Um, but you guys understand, like, and again, every state's different. So you guys actually reaching out and talking to people to understand where those lines are can help us do a better job. Because if I'm now obligated to disclose, but I say something stupid like, well, there's mold in this corner, or there's a settlement crack, or there's a, you know, there's a, a major foundation issue because I see a crack in the foundation. I don't know if it's major or not. You know, that's, that's why we're wanting you guys, or that's why we're looking at bringing in structural engineers to answer those questions for us. Um, on the liability side, under, for us as brokers is to understand that if there's something that I can see that the other side can also see and I choose not to disclose or I don't know to disclose, I'm going to have a complaint for non-disclosure. But if I see something that is then covered up by paint, by snow, um, you know, if it's covered up and I don't disclose it, now I'm actually liable for, for a fraud claim, which isn't covered by my errors and emissions insurance. And it creates a much higher level of liability uh, for us. So, um, Oh, Heather, that might be the case that, that the questions may only be seen by us. So I apologize if that's the case. So um, again, educating brokers on the use of inspections so that we understand really what it's supposed to be. One of the things that I really wish we can get across to inspectors or, or to, to, to the real estate side of it is that your guys' inspection is a great opportunity for us to see the things that we should be getting the further investigation in. As it says on the bottom of every single section of your entire inspection, what I shouldn't be doing is reaching up some orifice and pulling a number out and saying, oh, well, why don't we just ask for this as a quick negotiation? That, that's it's completely inappropriate. We don't know if the issues are, are, are how serious they are until we get that further investigation. And that's a part of where we can rely on you guys a little bit and going through there too. Um, on the referral process, uh, as far as like how you get to be uh, referred by brokers, um, again, the more you're out there, the more active you are, so if you are reaching out to them on Facebook, if you're reaching out to them on Instagram, like do a little cyber stalking and get those contacts, but it's not just the one-time communication. It's not just the, hey, here I am. And it's not just stopping by the office and bringing your, your card with like a Tootsie roll on it, especially now because a vast majority of brokers aren't working in the offices right now. They're just, they're just not. So like you can go into, into an office and you can look in the mailbox and there'll be like 20 different flyers from, you know, from all kinds of different inspectors and lenders and home warranty companies, all of them with a Tootsie Roller or a sucker attached to it. And what happens when I come in at the end of the month and pick up my stuff for the first time, it all goes in the trash. So it didn't do you any good for that one-time contact. So being able to, to reach out and get to us and, and establish that value and talk about education or reaching out to the office or to the association and being able to provide education on that aspect is gonna is going to get you a lot more exposure really quickly um, for a lot less money as well. So, you know, sort of going through that, but you guys understanding what we're looking for when we're referring again is I want somebody, if I'm doing it the right way, I want somebody who's going to do as much as possible to make sure that my buyer isn't getting screwed and that I have less liability. So when you're approaching the conversation from that perspective and, and you can sort of be blunt about it, then things are gonna be very different. When you're working directly with buyers, you know, again, you know, understanding that value proposition of I'm not here to, you know, to try to kill the deal, but I am wanting to make sure that you have all the information you can to make a really good informed decision and to know what you're getting into so that you don't have surprises later. That's one of the biggest aspects of it. And, and a part of that education process is I've been trying to really teach consumers and brokers and everybody that a home inspection in, in most of the states and how we handle it is very similar to like a phase inspection. So for those of you guys that are commercial, uh, certified commercial inspectors or doing environmental uh, work on that, I, I use that analogy of you guys are coming in, you're gonna bring the knowledge you have of the property, you're gonna look at what you discover on the visual inspection of it, um, much like a phase one inspection is gonna come through and see what you identify. But the part of that is when I do a phase one in a commercial, it's, it's knowing that we're probably going to have recommendations for further investigation that the, the consumers are going to do. Like, it's just a part of it. We know that we're going to get invasive inspections or we're going to get further looks into things. And so we need to be more educated on the home inspection side to just have the consumers and have the brokers know that there should be a second part of this. It shouldn't just be a one-sided deal um, on, on just your inspection. 
On the seller, on the seller side of it, um, again, a lot of you guys are doing a really good job in getting out and marketing pre-inspections. When you're talking about the pre-inspection, being very upfront to, to the consumer, to the brokers, to just in general, that there's goods and bads with that. If I'm working with you and you're an awesome inspector who has amazing tools, you might find 30 more things, small, big, whatever, that maybe a different inspector who's coming in, you know, that, that's still using tools from 10 years ago, that they're not going to find. Now, it's a good thing because we're getting disclosure and discovery to the buyer, but it's also more liability for the seller because now they might end up having to negotiate things that the buyer's inspector never would have found. So we've got to really make sure that we get that because if that deal falls through, everything that you guys are, are disclosing to us as potential defects, the seller now has to disclose to every future buyer from that point on. So again, there's some good and bad. It helps us to, to deal with things, to know what we have. We can get them addressed. We can get them fixed. But we're in a market right now where sellers are looking at it saying, what, you know, other than trying to keep the deal together, I've got 15 other buyers. I don't think I really need to worry about this buyer walking away because I've got a backup offer for more money. So you know, how we leverage the value of the pre-inspection to that person is, is really, really important. Um, but again, in a lot of your markets, it might be shifting away from the pre-inspection on by the seller to the pre-inspection by the buyer and having the buyer actually come through and say, hey, we're going to do our inspection prior to offer. Um, and, and again, a lot of your markets where you have like coming soon listings or we're going to take offers for four days or whatever those situations are, that's an opportunity to get a pre-inspection for the buyer so that when they make an offer without the inspection provision, it's because they've already had the opportunity not that they waived it. So it's, it's a very different perspective to take in what we're doing. So when you're marketing yourself to the buyers um, or, and, and to the sellers, you know, what are you doing to kind of separate yourself off? Are you certified for mold? Can you do radon? Are you doing water quality um, and, and septic? In a lot of our areas, and, and water quality is not just a thing for people in rural areas on like small um, uh, shared wells or, or wells or, or little community water systems. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more issues where in a lot of our city systems, there's still hard water, there's a high level of fluoride, there's a lot of stuff going on that if you guys actually would do a water quality test for us, we might actually be able to, to work with a consumer to say, hey, you would be better served um, by getting in a certain kind of filter or filtration system or whatever it is so that we have fewer issues of sediment settling in tanks or build up in the lines on your in-floor uh, in floor radiant heat or in your tankless water heaters. And so all of that stuff can be really good for us to help our consumers know how to better protect themselves later. Um, again, what's, what's making you stand out? Can you, you know, what's your background? What are your certifications? What testing are you approved to do? And, and for me, one of the bigger things is what tools are, are you guys implementing? And there's a lot of things that we're seeing that some of you are adopting and I think it's amazing um, that, that you guys are, are working to actively stay ahead of uh, the competition and to stay current with what the market is. So there's a few things I've got up here that a lot of our inspectors still aren't doing. We talked before, having a new home inspection with phased inspections. And I mentioned this earlier, and I'm going to talk about this again on the second part, but going in, do the, do the pre-inspection or do the inspection as a part of the purchase, and then offering to come back out in two to four weeks um, so you guys are, can, can upcharge, you can pay it up front or they can have additional services um, and then to come back out and, at, at the 11 month. And again, for states that have like a one year implied warranty, that becomes a huge safety net and a security factor for the buyers coming into the property. And it keeps you in front of the buyer and the broker because you can also do a follow up with the broker and just say, hey, let me know, you know, as a part of the service, I'm going up, going back out. We're doing our 11 month service and, and it, it just helps everybody kind of stay there. Um, Doing virtual summaries on your walkthroughs has become a really, really crucial tool for a lot of the folks that I'm working with um, and a really good tool for them when they're, uh, when they're trying to go back and look at it. Because if it's simply just a written summary um, with maybe one picture in the back, it, it may or may not be as functional for them. But if you're, as you're going through there, um, when you can go through it, and, and I, I've got in here, use a gimbal. When you're doing the walk through the house, if you can have a really good stable image with a good quality image, that's going to make things a lot easier. So when you're doing it on the gimbal, it makes it really nice. You can zoom in, you can point up, it's got a really good stable image, and you can describe, here's what I'm seeing, here's what the concerns are. So you can sort of restate what the inspection is going to do, 
But for a lot of our people, they will go back and look at the, at the visual side. And so when you provide the digital inspection, you know, if you send it to me online, when I get to that section, I can click on a link, it'll take me to the video. And then if that's something that I want to have the um, plumber, electrician, roofer, whatever, go look at, I can simply send them that link for that one small portion of the service that I want to have looked at. It's also great because then we have something evidentiary to show that the buyer had knowledge, that it was disclosed, that were covered, um, and, and I think it's just it's just a really good protection for us all the way around. Um, for a lot of you guys that are doing REO or vacant homes or you know anything where services aren't turned on, um, and again, this is where you have to sort of look at like what's your liability, what are you comfortable with, you know how how does that stand for you? Um, but you know being able to take an air compressor out to check the you know to do a pressure test on the water system, to do a pressure test on the gas system, even if there's no gas line or, or propane tank connected, we can still pressure test the systems to, to verify that they're working um, on at least that side. Um, having a generator to, you know, to, and again, you have to determine your level of comfort with this, um, but having a generator where you guys can test the electrical systems and make sure that things are working and functioning and, you know, where we are on those things, that's a really crucial thing. And so when I'm working with folks that are buying vacant or REO properties, those are services that I'm that I'm recommending to them, you know, to find somebody who's willing to do that or that has a relationship with either a plumber or an electrician that will do it for them. Uh, a lot of you guys are using drone. If you're not, I highly, highly recommend looking into it. But you also have to get your uh, your FAA uh, certification to do that. There's a lot of issues that come up with that. You've got to make sure that you really understand that. But um, what I'm looking for is not just the roofing inspection. I think that having um, I, I don't disagree. If the meter's still attached, it's, it can be a big issue. I agree with that, Robert. Um, but having getting getting beyond just the roof inspection, because with the drone, you guys can also look at are there are there gaps in the siding? Is there something else that from the ground visual inspection that you would not have been able to see? Um, you know, are there issues with the soffit? Is there ventilation issues? Um, and maybe even getting a little bit further back to look at the property to, you know, because maybe there's something that you can see that maybe, you know, might not have been seen before, um, discoloration in, in, in grass or anything like that, that could be an indicator of other kinds of issues. Um, and if you're using infrared, one of the things that I, that I, I just bought a house this last year, pitched it to the inspector I work with, it was something that they hadn't been doing. A lot of folks are using infrared for very specific systems, like you're checking the electrical panel, um, you're, you're checking very specific things. I asked them, what would it, how much will you charge me to go ahead and do a full uh, infrared uh, shot of the whole house? And when they were going through it, they're like, wow, I just, you know, like I realized that now I can see where we have insulation issues. There's differences in insulation values in the ceilings. Here's where you've got some heat loss at. You know, on the outside of the home, I realized that there was a heat loss coming from this area that was covered up by the siding. I couldn't see that. When I went in back into the crawl space, I was able to see what was causing that. Um, I had a property in Vail where they discovered a very small misting leak inside of the wall on a third floor uh, bathroom that wasn't visual. It could, you couldn't see it at all, but they were able to see the, the, the moisture signature, the, the, the coolness on the, on the infrared, and they called it out, and they were able to fix that. And that property alone, it was a $12 million home, three-story home. Had they not caught that, those buyers were not planning on coming back into the home for several months. So there was a chance that that could have caused hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. Um, and so that was a huge saving grace for those folks. So again, those are things to kind of look at. Um, even walking through the house and having a blacklight to look at like pet stains, like are they representing that they've had no pets? Maybe they didn't, but maybe the previous person did or you know, things like that. There's a lot of things you guys have tools to do that can help us when we're, when we're moving forward to make sure that the buyer's really protected in a way that we've never thought about before or done. Um, on your testing services, again, what are you certified for? Um, we're seeing in a lot of states where septic uh, is now being required, um, and, and it has been for a while in some states, and it's newer in other states, where we have to have a, an actual septic certification approved by the Department of Health um, with, with people that are also approved by the Department of Health to um, to actually transfer the property. We can't even do a transfer property until that's done. And I will tell you guys, I struggle in those states where the same person who's pumping the septic and is gonna be bidding to do the septic work is also one of the only ones that's, that's qualified to do the septic certification. That's a huge bias for me. I don't like it. 
Um, I, I, I think it's bull um, when, when that's the only place I have to go to because inevitably there's always something wrong. Um, yet when I brought in, uh, you know, unbiased third party people, it's a very different perspective. A lot of times it's not the issue that they said it was. Um, again, resources for contractors without bias. We talked about that before. I know some of you guys struggle with that. It, from the broker's perspective, I might not always know um, service providers for the things that you guys are pointing out when you're going through here. Um, and then for continued relationships with your people, um, getting the new home, uh, again, I talked about this before, the, the new home with phase inspections, that's a continued service. And I would say add on to that and do annual or biannual reviews um, with maintenance schedules. Go out and kind of talk about like, let's, let's do a quick thing. Let me walk through the property every two years with you to talk about the deferred maintenance that I mentioned in the inspection. So we can come out and see, are you at a point where it's getting to be an issue so that we can actually keep up with the things that we have so you don't end up having these things be material defects later that cost you a lot more. Um, again, having uploaded video content. If you guys go through, there are a lot of a lot of you guys that are doing this, and I think it's a great, great service. And, and you guys can see um, Ben does this a lot, and like there's a lot of years where he'll go out and he'll he'll talk about things that, that he's seeing in different properties. I would say try to do it in a way to where you're not showing what the whole property is. Like if you're on the roof, focus on that one spot. If you're you know down in certain area, focus on that one spot. Try not to actually you know create. Um, biases about the, the home itself because people in your community might know that house. So if you can do it in a way to where you can maintain the confidentiality which property you're working on, um, that would be a really good thing. Also know that before you guys can post that information, um, you would need to have permission from the current owner, especially if you're taking images of an interior perspective or something that um, is not in the general view of the public. So there, there are some, some trespassing issues that you have to deal with to make sure that you're doing that. But those are things that are great for brokers, it's great, you know, when you're working with a seller, you say, hey, here's, you know, something I noted, if you want, here's some other videos where I talk about that, if it's something that you want to try to take care of yourself. So again, there's a lot of things you guys can do. And then that keeps you engaged and has contacts with those people that you might not otherwise have. Um, again, uploading video content for homeowners. Um, and again, that could be a part of your inspection where you might also have supplemental information to talk about, you know, if you're buying a log home, I've got some supplemental information for that. If you're buying a SIPS construction, I've got some supplemental information for that. If you have this kind of a roof, here's something online that I have for you. So having that information so that the consumers can go and access it in their own time is a really, really good service as well. Um, doing testing services after the sale, like annual servicing. If you guys can come out and do a, you know, if you can do a pressure test or if you can, you know, for folks that have um, radiant heat or, or um, uh, tankless heaters, reminding them like there's reasons why you want to do, you know, do the servicing on those to maintain the, the, the life of them, um, checking water heaters and furnaces or things like that, or, or, you know, again, doing the things that you guys would do to say, yeah, this is an issue that we didn't see two years ago, but you might want to have a plumber or an HVAC person come out to check it. Um, and also doing, uh, providing season resources on maintenance, um, whether that's uh, providers to come out and do um, sealant stuff or to do driveway work or road work or, or whatever it is on the property um, and having some seasonal stuff. But those are things that you can, every quarter, you can sort of have a reason to reach out and, and, and contact the consumer and say, hey, here's a few things that you might want to think about as we're heading into this time of year. And here's some, you know, here's some different local people that we have here. And you might even just pull it from Yelp, be like, hey, here's the seven providers that Yelp has for this. And that way it's just an outward uh, refer or, or, or it's not a recommendation, it's just a resource that you're providing that you really have no liability to um, at that point. So let's go and take another stop here. I'm going to go back through some of the questions that we have. Would you like me to read them out for you? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Scott said, I like the general approach, InterNACHI template agreement supplemented with proper insurance. If you don't like the job, you can have your money back and we will scratch the job. If I did a bad job and you're pretty, you're, <laughs> I don't know what that is, suffers later, I will pay for every bit of it after we go through the process. So it's lots of comments. Uh, one person says, is it better to sell a all-in-one inspection or should I separate them? Um, 
I think that being able to be really clear so that the consumer can compare apples to apples, because if you're saying, here's my fee and it's all inclusive and it's higher than what another person's fee might be, that might dissuade them until you show them that you're including those um, in there. I, I, th I think that would be really crucial. Um, I don't think it's bad to, to offer it both ways. Like here's my base, here's the menu of services, or we can do it as an all-inclusive for this. And maybe there's some discounts by them, you know, doing add-on packages of, um, you know, here's my my premium or or my plus or whatever services. I think that's not a bad way to do it. Um, James White was was saying like when you're talking about um, uh, having um, a lot of you guys are talking about like hold harmless or things like that. And I'm I'm going to tell you right now, um, especially in the states where you guys have licensure, uh, we're we're looking more and more at competency claims. We're looking more at what you're doing and having language that indemnifies you or is a hold harmless against you, um, or even sometimes even against the broker. When it comes down to it, it really doesn't have a whole lot of, of bearing or weight to it if they can prove that we were negligent or um, or incompetent or, or outside of our scope of service. It really makes no difference. They're warm and fuzzy clauses, but they don't really do anything um, when we're being held to that. If you guys do want to have a really good resource, Internachi has legal counsel that has actually drafted a lot of the clauses, a lot of the language um, that, that a lot of your formats use. So you have a, an amazing resource with Internachi on protecting yourself on those legal aspects. So um, uh, Hiram was asking, where do we post the videos? Uh, Spector is horrendously slow in uploading. Um, I'm gonna walk in and, and I think somebody commented below that. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, I'm actually gonna give you guys a whole lot of, of different uh, social media sites that you can go to. And what's kind of nice is if you're uh, wanting to really build your efficiencies, you have um, kind of like list hub services where you can present it on one area and it will push out to 10 or 15 different forms of social media for you. And you don't have to do anything um, other, other than just that, that one posting on it. Um, I never make for the trades, so, so let's go back. You have several there that are, are dealing with the hold harmless clause. So I think yep. you, you've answered that very well. And, and I think they are just commenting on it. Right. Uh, is it better to sell the all in one of the packet? I got that, the hold harmless clause. All right, now I'm gonna go back to the general comments or the, so I'm gonna go to the chat, the ones that you guys can't see. Um, so Timothy talking about uh, the Pacific Nor Northwest, I, I like I said, I actually, I just did a class two days ago for the Seattle King County Association, uh, Seattle King County Association of Realtors. And we talked about that. We talked about multiple offers. We talked about some of the services that they have up there. And again, this is something that you're seeing. They have forms um, that allow for pre-inspection. It's something that we're really trying to recommend either pre-inspection or a short time frame for the buyer to do an inspection afterwards. Um, I do I do agree that in inspections and especially pre-inspections have been non-existent, um, but a part of that is the education to the broker and to the consumer. You know, if the brokers really understand the liability that they're taking on when, when we're negotiating deals and thinking it's a good deal, when we're not allowing the buyer to do that because the buyer's waiving inspections, that that is such a horrible thing and such a bad position to put a seller into. And so if we can educate people better on that, that will start to shift back again. Uh, if the seller, seller shows the prospective buyer their pre-inspection report, is that frowned upon? My agreement says that I won't be liable by the buyer uh, for seller. Um, so what you guys need to remember is that anytime that a seller does a pre-inspection, um, we're, we're stepping into sort of a gray area. Your agreement says that that is for the purpose of that person having it for, for their informational purposes. But by law in a lot of states and contractually in a lot of states, what it says is that any information that the seller has um, around material defects, they have a legal obligation or a contractual obligation to then disclose that to the buyer. So we're sort of forcing the issue for them to breach your contract um, by giving it to the buyer. So yeah, it, it, it definitely creates some, some problems for us in, in the fact that we've got a little bit of a conflict in, in the industries. I would be less concerned about the pre-inspection for the seller and having you be very clear and telling the seller that if they do want to present it to the buyer, that number one, that they should not be representing that that is an active or valid inspection for the buyer, that the buyer should still get their own because they might have had you just do a cursory review of certain things. So the buyer should always be getting their own inspections. Um, 
and to also stipulate that 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 you know that the seller stands to tell the buyer that the inspection that you performed was only valid as of the day that you performed it and that you're making no representations or warranties for anything beyond that where we have bigger issues is where your buyers are getting inspections done and they're doing a lot of really dumb things like then taking that inspection and offering to sell it back to the to, to sell it to the seller so they're basically selling your product your intellectual property that should not be happening right we need to be clear and a lot of the buyers don't understand the agreements that you guys have in your inspection i actually had one of the bigger attorneys in colorado who said well you know if i have a, a you know an inspector who's saying that you know they shouldn't be giving the inspection to the seller for the seller to use for the next buyer i would really question their integrity and i flat out called them out and i said are you fine with me taking whatever information you give me in this deal and then giving it to somebody else four months from now and using your language and your pictures and he's like well no that's you legally can't do that because they're my clauses and that would be plagiarism and i said yeah no shit. sorry for being blunt but it's the exact same thing your guy's product is good for that buyer for that service it shouldn't be given to the seller and we're actually seeing in in several states new mexico is on the forefront washington was on the forefront and saying uh, and this is going to be really different for some of you guys where your states are 180 degrees we have a lot of states where they're saying the inspection will not be given to the seller unless the seller specifically asks for it for a part of the negotiation or something that the buyer is asking the seller to perform we will not give the inspections to the sellers um, for a lot of reasons. One, in a seller's market, a seller shouldn't want it. It creates further liability for them if the deal falls through because they have to disclose it to the other side, right? But it's also a breach of agreement for the buyer to give it to the seller, knowing the seller would then have to give it to the next buyer. The breach of contract is not on the seller. The breach is on the part of the buyer who hired you and then shares your intellectual property. So you guys need to really be doing more to protect yourselves and, and clarifying and getting even legal counsel or the people in the industries that we're working with to realize that you have, a, you have an ongoing liability when people take your reports and represent that it's still valid for future things or when they're taking your information and sharing it or even more so selling it without your permission. So there's a lot of things in there that I want you guys to do to really protect you because your information, I need to realize I shouldn't be relying on that two months from now either. So uh, if the seller shows, uh, sorry, uh, is there a 14 day limit on getting inspections done after the offer is made? No, every state is different. Every contract is different. Um, some states have uh, kind of um, default numbers of days that you can get that in. Um, but that's typically something that is negotiated term in every single contract. And again, we have some in some markets where they're actually wanting the buyers to get the inspections. They'll say, we're gonna go on the market for 10 days. The, any buyer that wants to make an offer needs to get the inspection done before they present an offer. And we have other markets where, you know, like for me, I try to give like 14 to 21 days. And sometimes I'll say within the first 10 days, I'll get my general inspection done, but then I build in an additional week or two weeks to allow for the opportunity for further investigations. Other states, that's, that's a given. In Washington, if I if I present an inspection objection and it triggers further investigation, then I automatically in the contract have an opportunity for that further investigation if I use the right form. And we have a lot of other states that do that as well. So there's no given time frame um, on a, on a national level. Seller sell as is to keep from divulging is required. How does that affect the liabilities between the brokers and the inspectors? So Robert, sellers that think that they're selling as is have no idea what that actually means. In, in most areas, and this is not always, but in most areas, in most states, sellers have a legal obligation to at least disclose latent defects, the things that you can't see even with a general visual inspection or, or that the buyer might not see when they go through there. Other states have a requirement where the seller is supposed to disclose anything material that they have knowledge of, and you can't waive that off. So if a seller really wants to sell the property as is, then their disclosures should be incredibly thorough because if they don't disclose something, they're still on the hook for it in the future. So in a lot like, in, in I'll use Colorado as an example. In Colorado, their contracts actually say that the buyer's taking the property as is, where is, with all faults. But what it says prior to that is subject to the other provisions in the contract, the buyer's taking the property as is, where is, with all faults. And those other provisions include 
disclosure by the seller, the buyer's opportunity for inspection, the buyer's opportunity to do walkthroughs, to make sure that the property is as represented on the day of closing. And when we close on it, then they're taking it as is. You guys have a lot of folks that are doing fix and flips around, you know, that are out there and they're doing this and they're saying, well, I'm selling it as is. I made all these improvements. I'm selling it as is. And they're not disclosing anything and they have no idea that they are taking on huge amounts of liability. So again, a lot of this is an educational thing. Brokers aren't telling the consumers. Inspectors aren't telling the consumers. And when I say consumer, I mean the seller, the person who's gone through and made the modifications and assuming that they don't have to disclose anything. And that's that. What we're what we are setting ourselves up for is when the market shifts, and it will shift, is a lot of lawsuits. And what it's going to come down to is who does everybody think is going to be liable in it? If you're in a state with license as a licensed inspector, it's going to be you. It's going to be me. It's going to be the broker on the other side. Why? Because we all have insurances. That's why. So, um, yeah, I, I really struggle with that whole as is thing. I, I try to teach against that conversation. Um, even for bank-owned properties and REOs, right, where they give it, a, they, they literally have a 14-page as-is disclosure. We have no knowledge. We're not doing anything. We're only going to tell you what we know by law. And they tell us as the brokers that list the property, you will not do any further investigation of the property, right, because they don't want us discovering anything. They're not going to do a pre-inspection. When I do my walkthrough, it's a cursory walkthrough. But if I'm standing there and I see a discoloration, if I see like an obvious the wires coming through, I'm taking pictures and I'm sending it to, to the bank and saying, by law, I've seen it, I have to disclose it to you. And now that you have knowledge, you have to disclose it. And when you do it in a legal aspect where they understand that by law, they have to, there's no circumventing that. So um, all thoughts on, uh, any thoughts on no report, no photo, pre-inspection buyer, walk and talk. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think anytime that we do that, um, and, and there's nothing in writing to fall back on, everybody is taking on liability at that point in time, because, Christ, I mean, I, I have buyers that we get into the third house that we're looking at, and they can't remember the differences from the first house to the third house, and then we get into the contracts, so or we're, we're doing multiple offers, and <clears throat> no, I think I think having something to back up is a protection. Documentation is is crucial for all of us, for you guys, and for us. Uh, what time, what types of tools are you expected, uh, excited to see inspectors use versus inspectors that may have outdated equipment? Um, again, having current FLIR cameras or infrared cameras, having drones where you actually have decent image quality. Um, you know, if you're still flying a first generation Phantom, um, that, that's something that, you know, my, I, I gave mine to my neighbor's 10 year old kids um, to, to use just for them to like goof around with it. It's, it's just not a quality tool anymore. Um, you know, so going through and like I said, when you look at like the, the vendor um, partnerships that we have through InterNACHI, there is a whole litany of different services that you guys um, can tie into. And what I would say is, is the more things that you're certified that you can actually do inspections for, um, if, if it's allowed in your state, that would be huge. Um, and, and, and also educating us as brokers to say, look, you know, if you like if you walk into the house and you see something that's obviously not right, you don't necessarily have to wait for me as the inspector to flag it on the inspection. Why don't we have the electrician come out at the same time? We'll kind of double down on our inspections and, and get that taken care of. So, and I'm going to like, so walk through some of this again a little bit. Uh, visual summary considered to be a verbal contract. Does it increase liability? Um, again, anything that you don't have documentation on, I think creates further liability for, for everybody. Um, Robert, again, I, again, I don't, I don't disagree on the generator. Um, on a lot of the properties that we work with, they've pulled the gas meter or they've pulled the um, um, uh, the propane tank. Um, and so those things just don't exist. Um, I, I don't disagree with electrical services, something you've got to be careful of because um, you got to, and again, I think you need to be trained, certified, competent to know what you're doing or have a partnership with an electrician that can come and do that for us and just be aware of that um, up front. Um, and again, so yeah, I, I think the recording should be available for, for later viewing, but you wanna make sure that the consumer understands that they can't post it further. It's gotta be private just for them. Um, it can't go on social media. And if you guys want to be able to present something that you can post on a YouTube channel or, or an informational session that you're getting permission from the seller and or the listing broker um, or the buyer and say, hey, after you close on the property, do I have your permission to use what we found for educational services for other people? So. 
In the Q&A, John, there's a question. Michael asked if an inspector only has a bond rather than an E&O and general liability policy. Is that frowned upon by agent brokers? And is there a big price difference between the two? So the the E and O is uh, is is more of did you forget something or did you make a mistake of something that wasn't based on fraud or gross uh, gross neglect? That that's that's what E and O is going to cover for you, um, and that's a coverage for you. And you can also pick up policies that will then cover us. The bonds are typically, and again, you have to look at the policies and see what the coverages are. And so I'm, I'm making very broad generalizations here. Um, the bond is something that is there to protect um, the consumer in the event that um, you or somebody working for you breaks something, steals something, does something on the property um, th that that there's a financial hit for. So again, they're they're different insurances for different for different issues. Um, you know, I think I think having you know is great because if you miss something in your, especially if your license, you have to, in a lot of states, you have to have it. So if you happen to miss something as a part of the inspection, or if it wasn't stated and it created a problem, you have coverage. Um, am I also named in that? Can I be co-insured on your, you know, um, you know, you're, you're doing something on the property and you, you step through the, the, you know, in the ceiling, you step through the sheetrock in the ceiling. That's what a bond would cover. Um, you know, or, or if, you know, if something, something bad happens in a property, you're covered there. Having liability insurance is also, uh, you know, to me, a really important thing, especially if you have a consumer and you're taking the buyer down the stairs, or if you're with somebody and, and they're walking downstairs and, you know, you're pointing out, well, the different elevations of the stairs, if they don't match up, then it messes up the pacing and then the rhythm of your steps. And you can actually be a trip hazard and they trip and fall that's a liability on you guys. So having different insurances to cover those are going to be pretty important for you as well. So. Um, Another person, Dale asked, you mentioned a gimbal for an iPhone. Is that in lieu of a body camera? Wondering if a body cam is worth using during this COVID period. So I think body cams are great for um, kind of generalized stuff. The gimbal is something that I like when I'm doing a virtual showing or if I'm walking through a property, um, and I've got my phone in my hand, or if it's, or like you guys, if it's a body cam, it's bouncing as you're walking. Having a handheld gimbal um, is something that's going to stabilize the image. So when I'm doing my walkthroughs, you know, and I pan, like I might pan very quickly, but the gimbal will move it much more slowly. So I get a, I get a cleaner, better picture. It's not blurry. Um, it, 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 and you guys, honestly, you'll actually find that there's a lot of consumers that will actually get nauseous watching the videos when you're doing a walkthrough with a handheld device. Um, or your body cam, like they just, they visually can't do that. And so having a gimbal is just going to make things a lot smoother for you. And it makes it look a lot more professional, um, you know, on, on the quality of what you're getting. So. Nicole asked, could it help to reference that the payer of report shall have exclusive rights to information supplied in the report? Any transfer of information supplied shall be dent, shall be deemed bridge uh, i'm sorry <laughs> um, anyway yeah, that's, yeah she, she's yeah, saying I'm breach. Proud to say it <laughs> yeah no yeah nicole was asking for a breach of copyright um, yeah, yeah, or, or a breach of the rule um and nico what you're going to see is that in most of your uh in, in most of the templated inspection forms when you actually read through the buyer agreement it already says that um, and if it doesn't, you might want to look at one that does or reach out to Internachi. I believe they have a form that you guys can use to do that. And, it's, and again, it's, it's, there's a lot of protections that come into place for you guys because it stipulates that, you know, the, the consumers understand that it's only valid for the, for the person who bought it. Um, it's only valid for the date that it was performed on because things change in the property. And so there's some things you can put in there to try to reduce your liability for any other uses outside of there. Um, but it does also create an opportunity that if, if they decide to sell it to the seller or they decide to sell it to a, a future person, you have the same copyright protections as a professional photographer would have if I got the photos and then I sold them to somebody else to use for a future listing for a future purpose. There, there's copyright protections that come into play with that. Um, British Columbia, you're in a huge seller's market right now uh, where inspections are being waived. And I get asked to do a walkthrough with a client with no inspection report, just verbal observations. What are you, again, that's sort of, sort of the same thing. I, I get it. I understand it. I know in a lot of those markets that that's sort of what they're coming down to. 
Um, again, I think if the sellers understand the fact that they're taking on liability for anything that um, that they might have missed as a part of their representations when they're forcing the buyer to waive the inspection, that 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 will probably change. And in a couple of years, we're probably not going to be in a seller's market. Right? Things are shifting. We're seeing those changes happening right now in some of our markets already. And as we shift more into a buyer's market, you guys need to be prepared for the fact that the buyers are going to have a lot more control in the situation. They're going to be wanting to get and, and having the opportunity to get all kinds of inspections. So I would say you guys should be taking this time right now to gear up on your education, your certifications, the services, and adding services that you can do. Because when we shift back more into a buyer's market, the buyers are going to have the opportunity to do a lot more work and a lot more investigation in the property. So is the buyer legally required to provide any reports that were done simply or the information for the reports? Um, so Sheldon, that is a state-to-state -state issue. Um, you'd actually need to check with the uh, the, the laws in that state, because some states do require um, that, that the information is provided over. Some states contractually, because they know it damages the seller, have actually written it to where it will not be provided over. Um, I, I, I struggle with this. You know, One of the things that I always recommend to brokers is if I get the seller's property disclosure, and if I'm walking through as the buyer broker and I see some things that I'm not sure about, and I say, hey, you might want to get further investigation of that. <coughs> I'll often go ahead and get permission. I'll take pictures of it or video of it. And I send what I've seen along with the seller's property disclosure to you, you know, because I want to give it to the, to the, the more qualified professional who's going to come through and actually review those items to, to look at and say, here's, here's more information about it. Or yeah, you really should get further investigation of it. Um, or yeah, they said they fixed it, but they really didn't. They painted it, but they didn't do anything else. Like those are things that you guys might be able to look at. But in some states, my understanding is that we're not allowed to do that because that is interfering with your process as well. So that's a really tough question for me to answer because every state has different guidelines on how that part gets handled on the sharing of the information. Uh, does the real estate agent ever hold the home inspector harmless on their policy? Uh, no, and unfortunately, it's not something that we're able to do because we're not the ones engaging you. Um, so it's, it's a little bit, I, I know this is kind of weird, um, if I am the one who is recommending, who's recommending you, then I take liability for that recommendation. And then you're kind of on your own. The only time that it would sort of go the other way would be if you were recommending me as an agent. So, so the liability sort of falls more on the recommendation side, and it typically doesn't, doesn't go the other way. And was saying, sell of certain articles prohibited, uh, does apply, no person shall sell or mark any manner whatsoever. Also, you're taking that from your, uh, from your contract. So I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and then let's kind of go back over here when you, uh, when we do pre-listing inspection, the seller fixes issues and we do a re-inspection amendment. Um, yeah, somebody was saying, was talking about that. And that, that's one of the reasons why I really like pre-inspections is for the seller to fix it. But we've got to remember that in many States, the seller will still have to disclose what they fixed. So, you know, at that point, um, it should, should be done with the intent of knowing that the seller might end up having to give the inspection along with the list of the things that have been fixed. That actually upsells the home and it adds more security for a buyer coming in. If you say, well, we had inspection done, a pre-inspection, and we fixed everything, and, and then the seller is refusing to provide that to my buyer along with the list of the repairs made, that feels sketchy. But again, it's you know, we have to look at what their agreement is with you guys on that side. Uh, does the report need to re-disclose or just the information from the report? Um, so Sheldon, again, that depends on the state. The, uh, in, in certain states, it's the information from the report that has to be disclosed, but from a seller, buyer, or a broker's or a realtor's perspective, um, I'm not going to, to uh, transpose every, sing every single thing that you wrote into my words to pass on for disclosure because I'm taking on liability when I do that. So the recommendation is going to be as a listing broker, if you receive the inspection, um, even though there's definitely some, some copyright issues, the recommendation from a liability standpoint is to give that information, the report to the new buyer, um, if it was given to us. Again, the breach of contract was actually when the buyer gave it to the listing broker, unless that's a requirement in your state. So again, just a, a lot of different ways of, of, of how that stuff goes. Um, any other questions on, on this stuff before we go on? 
All right. Don, I don't see any. You've answered all of them as you you have done great. Thank you. <laughs> all right, let me get back to the slideshow here. Come on. There we go. So as we've gone through, when I now when I talk about what is your brand, um, and, and when I say brand, I don't just mean like your your company name. I don't mean the franchise services that you work for. I mean for you, what is your brand? What is it that you want people to remember you for? Why am I hiring you? Um, and how are you making sure that you're always going to be top of mind? So you being able to identify yourself and having something that that separates you. Mm -hmm. From the rest of the crowd is gonna is, is gonna be really really important when you're moving forward, especially as we start getting to markets where we have thousands of inspectors that are working out there. You want to make sure that you stand out, um, and whatever you're doing is also going to be valid for you. So when we're looking at tapping into social media aspects, again, I mean, here's either you know so there, there this was an article I pulled on the top 100 apps. Um, this actually was from 2020. Uh, but I got it at the end of 2020. If you guys were in the session with me last year, it's the same list that we had. Um, a lot of them are games, a lot of them are like different things. But when I'm looking on here, uh, you know, you can see Instagram, you've got uh, Twitter, there's Snapchat, Facebook, uh, Dropbox. Dude, if you guys are using Dropbox or Google Docs or anything like that, or, or have a Google Drive, those are really great services to put your information into and then give a secure link to the consumer so that they can go in and access the information on that file. Um, and then you can also document and see how often they've gotten into it. Did they download it? What have they done with it? Um, having, a, again, having a YouTube channel, I think is great. If you're gonna use, um, going back on here, uh, uh, let's see what else we have, Tumblr. Uh, to the, the T in the bottom of the 100 is for Tumblr. You've also got like me, we are other sites, um, Patreon, which is a paid site. This is going to sound kind of funny to some of you guys. OnlyFans. Um, OnlyFans is typically used when people are selling um, uh, more private parts of themselves on, online. But I've seen a lot of brokers and other professionals that are using that for paid subscription services for people to get information from them in a professional standpoint. So just kind of using these, understanding how, you know, what's out there. And then you can also see what the top, uh, this is about a year old, but what the top downloaded ones were. And you'll see, um, you know, the, the, the primary ones, and, and this hasn't changed a whole lot from last year, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok are going to be the primary ones that people are using. And every single one of those allow for a video, a, a, a story, a video feed, conversational pieces. Here's where I'm at today. Here's something new that I just saw. And you can have it to stay on there um, or you can have it to expire within 24 hours. So again, there's a lot of things that you can do to continue to market and promote yourself. You can do a Facebook story, expires in 24 hours. You can do a Facebook post and it's always there. Uh, Instagram is always going to be there. Um, again, TikTok is, is something that uh, some of these are more generational. Um, so I, I'm probably talking about some of these that you're like, I have no idea what the hell that is. That's okay. Um, it's something to look at, but if you can, uh, you know, if you're using these things, one of the things I also tell you is set aside and have a separate business account for what you're using these services for. Um, you probably don't want to have like a Facebook page, or if you're a little bit older, you might have like a MySpace page. I'm just getting a lot of someone really have that anymore. Um, you know, but whatever, or, or if you have a Twitter that like, if you've had a Twitter account for 20 years, you need to remember that any of that old stuff is still accessible by your consumers. So when you're posting things, having a separate business page that is not tied to your personal page could be really important. You know, if you've got uh, different views on stuff that's going on socially, if you have your, I don't know, spring break picks from 1984 or your bachelor party, you might not want your consumers seeing all of that information. Um, in a professional context. So just understanding the services that are out there is really key for you guys as well. So um, so I wanna, I wanna go and answer some questions on that um, to, uh, you know, we might kind of went a little bit quicker. I'm used to more interaction with this. So I wanna open the opportunity for you guys to be able to, to uh, get more questions and talk about some of the different social media sites that are out there. Um, I wanna hear what things you guys are using, what's really effective. So I'd like you guys to have an opportunity in the, Q and A or in the chat, um, and and we'll we'll talk about it. If there are services that you're using that you feel are really effective, um, and and ways that you're using it, I want to open this up to you guys 
uh, to go ahead and continue with us right now. As they may be posting that, John, here's a question. Uh -huh. Eric, he says, you were talking earlier about when a buyer waives the inspection, it's actually putting more liability on the seller. Could you please give a recap of how I could educate realtors with this point? Yeah, Eric, thank you for that. So the, the bottom line is in, in almost every state that I'm aware of, and when you're working with a realtor, not just a licensee, but a realtor, the realtors have an absolute obligation to make disclosure of anything we have knowledge of. Oftentimes we have this assumption that's, is there something that I knew about the property before that I'm bringing forward? But there's also the, the part of it that if I'm walking through the property, whatever I have experience in recognizing, I now have an obligation to disclose to the consumer. If the consumer is my seller, I'm telling my seller, they now have knowledge of that as well. And by law in many states, I have to give the seller that knowledge, even if it's a bank or an REO or something like that. Depending on the state, the seller then has an obligation to complete some form of uh, property disclosure form to disclose any material defects that they have knowledge of or latent defects that they have knowledge of. Now, that might be environmental issues. It might be, um, was there a smoker in the house? Um, is there, you know, we've got the obvious ones like lead-based paint. Do they have previous reports? Had they previously done a radon test or a lead-based paint test or anything like that? Any reports of, of that nature? And, and what it comes down to is if the seller could be shown to have reasonably had knowledge of something that didn't end up on that form, and then the buyer wasn't given the opportunity to do an inspection to verify what was or was not maybe put on that form for the buyer to have their own investigation of it. So if the buyer waives that investigation, then the seller is 100% liable for what may have been missed on their seller's property disclosure form because the buyer is purchasing the property based solely on the representations made by the seller and the broker. So if you're able to convey, you know, there's some danger in not allowing buyers to go through this and do this because you're basically the buyer's buying it based on what you as the broker are saying and what representations the seller's putting on the SPD. So if either one of you didn't put something, your seller could still be on the hook for that in the future doesn't matter if you have one offer or 50 offers, your seller has that liability. Are you comfortable with that? That's, that's one of the best ways that I found to approach a broker is when you show me where I have liability exposed to something or where my consumer is going to have liability exposed to something, I'm going to take more steps to make sure that we're being protected. So, um, so let's kind of go through here. So thoughts on a YouTube page, Paul? I, I think that having a YouTube page is great. Um, you can do longer videos. If you're going to post something um, over, oh man, I want to say 30 minutes or something like that, you have to uh, actually have a, um, shoot, it's like a verification process to show that you're, you're actually who you say you are. So if you're posting longer videos or sessions, or if you, um, again, one of the things I think are great is if you guys can do a panel session. So if you want to pull in and, and have, bring in a, a, a couple different brokers, um, and do something on Zoom or, or bring in an attorney um, and market it to like the Realtor Association in your, in your area to talk about liability of disclosure and, and defects and inspections and the value of those things and actually have like a panel of people and then record that session and put it on YouTube. Th those, are, those are great. I mean, I, I did one seven, eight months ago with the director of our real estate commission for our state. I also brought in legal counsel for the Realtor Association for our state. We just and, we, and we're talking about like brokers using transaction coordinators. It's an ancillary service. It's a 90 minute conversation. It is painful to watch. Like if I go back and watch it, it is painful to watch. Yet I've had over a thousand views of that full 90 minute thing and I've generated 250 calls from it. That's not a bad return, right? So I think having it out there is good. Making the more you do, and I also say, the more you do these things, the better you will get. You're, you guys need to know that your first like five, 10, 15 videos, um, I think the best way I can describe them is that they're going to suck and they're probably going to be boring and you're going to be awkward and you're going to be uncomfortable. And that's okay. It, it takes a lot to get used to seeing yourself and hearing yourself and just being comfortable doing that. And then your personality will come through and you'll start to figure out the areas where you can have a bit more fun and, and use some, uh, you know, use some interaction. When I'm, when I'm teaching and I want to kind of set the tone right away, 
you know, in my classes, and I'll just, I'll show you guys really quick. When I'm going through my stuff for, uh, you know, for a class, you know, I've got videos that I incorporate, um, you know, but I'll set my background. Like I'll talk about, you know, in class, you have to have your cameras on. So, you know, when your cameras are on, please make sure that you're aware that if you have, you know, anybody that, uh, you know, might be in your house, you know, coming up behind you or, you know, you don't, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you got to use the restroom, you, you, you can leave your iPad at home. Like I don't have to go in the bathroom with you. So, you know, I'll use little tools like that um, just to, uh, sorry, I'm going to take that one off now, um, just to, you know, to kind of lighten the crowd, you know, kind of get people more engaged and to talk about things that we've got going on. Um, and so you can use different tools like this. There's a system called, mm -hmm, it's MMHMM -M -M, that uh, we were talking a little bit, a, a little bit while ago with Miranda and Brenda with InterNACHI. Um, and for you guys, that's something where you can do sort of your video walkthrough and then you can present it using this mm -hmm system where you're in a small circle down here um, or you can sort of be in the background of it and have just like I've got here where I've got the background and I can point out and say, so, you know, when you're walking through the house, you'll notice like this ridge line on the roof right here is, is kind of weird. And, and so you can point things out like that and actively, you know, interact with it rather than simply having a picture of the roof. Um, and trying to point something out and draw an arrow or to circle or doing something like that, you can actually sit here and point out and say, you know, like this ridge line across here tends to get a lot of snow load in this area. And so that might lead to, you know, uh, the, the ice, ice buildup or things like that. And it might push shingles up and so whatever, you know, you guys have opportunities to use different tools that are out there to, to really enhance your business. So um, using Snapchat, you can do live interaction. If they have Facebook and they have Instant Messenger, you can do live interaction. If you have FaceTime, you can do live interaction. Um, if you have a, your phone or your tablet, you can go on Zoom and you can do a Zoom meeting with your clients. So again, all you have so many ways of interacting live with the people without having them be in the home with you right now, which again, saves time. You can record it. That helps save liability in that way when they say, well, he never said that, or she never said that, or they never said that. You can actually document, no, it was right here. And this is where I pointed out to you. And, and that's really reducing all of our liability across the board. So, um, so going back through um, Alignable, is, uh, I don't know, is anybody using Alignable? And, and we're talking about Alignable. There's also, there's so many different services that are similar to Alignable as well. Um, you know, we've got front door, front porch, um, next door, you've got all the different providers lists that you can go on, you've got LinkedIn, uh, and there's so many different professional referral networks to go to um, that we can that we can lean on. Um, those are great, but then you have to reach out and actually have consistent posts and consistent, whatever one you're using, you have to consistently use that and reach out to people to maintain those communications. Any social media format that you use, if you simply do like one post every once in a while, it's not going to be effective. You know, I, my YouTube page only has a couple of, of uh, you know, posts on it or a couple of videos on it because I use it as a secondary reference. It's not something I use for marketing my business. When I'm marketing my business, I have a whole separate set of tools that I use to generate business for myself. Um, so you also have to figure out like what you can consistently keep up with. If you can't keep up with it, it's not going to be it's not going to be effective. So you also have to get in the habit of doing like one, two, three posts a day um, of different things, just to kind of so that it, it stays active and and you stay high on people's um, lists. So, um, <clears throat> how soon do you hear about liability? Yeah. Uh, how how soon do we hear about liability? This is always an interesting question. Um, every state has a different statute around. Um, Oh, and I just forgot the term. This is bad. Um, statute of limitations. <laughs> so how far into the future can somebody still bring a claim against me? And when it comes to non-disclosure of material defects, and when it comes to things that were missed that the seller should have disclosed or that the broker should have disclosed, um, and we didn't, and that wasn't reflected on the inspection, typically it's X number of years after the point of discovery. That could be 20 years from now. I might have a buyer who buys the property and is, is, is on it for 20 years. And then when they're going to resell the property, they start doing some remodel work and they bought it remodeled on a fix and flip. And they discovered that there was a lot of things that were actually wrong with what they did that weren't to code, weren't done right. 
that weren't disclosed. And 20 years later, they can still come after the seller for, for those damages. So that's why I'm saying it's really important for people to understand when they're doing fix and flips, when they're trying to paint over things, when they're trying to cover things over to make it look pretty, they are taking on huge amounts of liability. So anything else? I'll just, I'll keep this open for a few minutes. Just uh, actually, I think we've got some more in the Q and A. Let's look at these. Uh, touch base again on a realtor requirements versus a broker liability. <laughs> so a, Every state, when you have a, a real estate license, you typically have different levels of license. It might be a salesperson's or a broker, or you'll have a, a broker associate and a, an employing broker. Um, and, and so there's different levels of education that come with those and responsibility. Typically, an employing broker um, or a broker in many states is going to be the one that has other people working for them. So I would say if you're looking at who you want to contact, it would be the employing broker, the broker in charge. Again, every state calls them something a little bit different. And they're going to be the ones responsible for everybody underneath them. And you being able to reach out to them to say, look, I want to train you so you can train your people. You meet that one person. You just became a resource for all 50 or 100 people that work for them. The difference between a realtor and a licensee is sort of like being a licensed inspector versus being a member of InterNACHI. That's, that's what it comes down to. When you become a member of InterNACHI, not just getting the license and being a licensed inspector, but you're a part of the trade organization. So you're, you're holding yourself to a higher standard. You, if you want to become a master certified inspector, those are, are things that we have on the realtor side where being a realtor, I have a separate ethical obligation. I have a separate education obligation that I have to work towards. And then on top of that, I can, we can also get different designations based on if, do I do commercial? Do I do international? Do I do farm and ranch? Like whatever it is, we have other designations the exact same way that you guys do. So it's, so it's very much along those same lines um, on that side. Uh, but a great way to get in front of a lot of people is to actually go to directly to the Realtor Association, become an affiliate member, be a, an active part of that association because what'll happen is when, if I am newer and I don't have anybody, I'm gonna reach out and see who is a member of our board or who's an affiliate member. And what we do with a lot of our associations is we'll actually bring in the affiliates and have them provide education and information. And you guys are kind of always top of mind for the, for the groups that we work with. Uh, Nico, the periodic inspection interval shall be based on the expected rate of deterioration, correct? Um, think of what you do. Like, like I, I have some inspectors I've worked with where they picked this up and they were doing it for homes. And then they started reaching out to homeowners associations like condos and townhomes and they do a an annual walkthrough to sort of look at deferred maintenance issues for the association to be able to get bids on so that they know what they should be setting money aside for for the next year and that's become a huge business for a lot of inspectors because in a lot of associations they're relying on their handy you know their handy person or even like the board president who may not have any understanding of those things and a lot of the condos have like they have internal boilers for the whole system, or they have heating or cooling systems that are for the whole units. And so by having an opportunity to be able to expand your business into that area um, can be huge for some of you guys to, to jump in and, and get a different area. Um, initial inspection for general properties for a periodic inspection. Yeah, so Nico's just providing some, some additional thoughts for you guys. Um, the inspections may be visual, closed uh, sample inspections. Yeah, so thank you, Nico, for providing that. Uh, what was it? What was that after you? Question there. Yeah. So the app that I use to change my background, like I'm doing today, this is just on Zoom. So when you're doing a Zoom meeting, when you look at uh, the, and you guys all have this right now, um, when you're on a Zoom meeting where you've got the ability to add your video, to, to turn your video on and off, and it says stop video, there's a little arrow next to that. And if I click on the arrow, I have choose virtual background. So when I go there, and some of these are standard, it's just a part of the system, I can actually come up and there's some that come with Zoom. So I can turn mine off. You guys can see I have a green screen behind me. I can blur whatever's behind me. So if I have something that walks behind me or sitting in my house, you can't see it. There's some standard ones that just come in the system. You know, they're, they're kind of cool, um, you know, on, on whatever you guys want to do. For me, when I'm working geographically in different areas, I will actually bring in pictures, you know, from the different areas I teach in. So if I'm in Seattle, I can cover that. If I'm in uh, Oregon, you know, this is Astoria. If I'm in Aspen, Colorado, you know, I've got pictures of Aspen. I've got pictures from Philadelphia. 
Um, you know, so I, I actually kind of import and bring in a lot of the pictures I use from different parts of the country so that I'm actually relevant to where I'm teaching at. You guys can do the exact same thing. You can talk about, you can have different pictures of the home or even um, bring in pictures and just load like the five or six pictures. So when you're having the conversation, you can kind of talk about what's going on. The other app that ties to um, Zoom or WebEx or whatever services you might have is called, mm -hmm, it's MM. HMM. It's in beta. It's a brand new one that's coming out. And essentially what it does is it takes the camera that you have or the, the camera system that you guys have in your system and it, uh, and it allows you to kind of make yourself bigger or smaller, or you can have your picture as the background. So sort of like what I've got here, I can have the pictures in my background and I can walk through the property and kind of point different things out about the property as I'm going through it with the consumer. And, and again, so if you can have five or six different pictures of a property, you have that ability to, to, to walk through there. So let me see if I can give an example of that. Yeah, so I come through here and, and maybe I'm, you know, I can kind of step back and say, well, you know, when you're looking at the property, like you can see, well, like this is AstroTurf. And, and so, you know, like you've got really low maintenance with this, but, you know, you've got the, the saguaro cactus. And so in, in Arizona, in this part of the county or in this part of the state, that's actually going to be protected plant. So if you wanted to do anything on the property, you'd actually have to get permissions to move that plant because they're protected. Or so again, any, anything informationally, you guys can throw that out there and it, it just becomes, you know, a little bit more information for the people that you're working with. What about the app or website that you mentioned where you can publish a video and send it out to multiple? So um, those are called list hubs, Hiram. So um, there, there's different services where uh, you can, and, and again, and I think um, you might actually be able to talk to the folks at Internachi. They might actually have a service that, you, that they would recommend for you. Um, but essentially I can have, depends on the service, maybe up to 10. So I can have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok, uh, my YouTube, um, any of those things. And if I go through and I put it in that one section, it will automatically post to all 10. You just want to make sure that all of those different formats that you're used are really branded in an effective way. So it doesn't matter which area I go to or where I see it at, I have your branding up there. If you're doing a video, if you have a, if you're doing pictures, um, you know, when you do that, if you guys can, rather than like posting right there, maybe you can set up your system to where you can always, or, or, or in your system, have it set up with a watermark. So maybe right here in all of my pictures, I've got my company logo. So no matter what, you know, my information's always on there. I'm always branding myself to do that. So again, when I talk about what's your brand, are people recognizing it? Are they automatically associating it with you? That's got to be really crucial as you're going forward um, and, and doing this. And, and again, there's so many different services that that do those same things. It, it becomes really helpful. You guys might even partner with different brokers and say, look, you know, if you want, I can do like little um, articles or blogs for you. Of like, I, I give you written things that you can put on your website or that they can post on their Facebook or their websites. And so you guys can create information and actually be a, uh, yeah, basically just be a creator. Um, and, 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 and create information that you can then share with the people that are out there that they can share across the board and they're marketing for you. I mean, how nice would it be if you can like go to one broker and have that broker say, man, like I just, I just saw this information and here's, you know, here's, uh, I, I want to send this out to all my consumers and they push it out to like 5,000 of their Facebook friends. They're sharing your post and you just went out to all 5,000 of their people. So again, you being a resource and relying on the, you know, your stuff to be a uh, informational for them can be great. So let's just see if there's any other ones. Um, so I actually, I actually use List Hub. That's the one I use. So that, that, was, that was why I was talking about that. That's one of the services I use. Um, but again, it's it's different. It's a little bit different for us in real estate because mine's actually pulling from what we call IDX providers, which is an internet data exchange that brokers use for MLS listings. Um, so I need to be tied into that system and, and push it out. But List Hub is one of the services that I use. I have a question for you, John. Yes, ma'am. When an inspector is going into uh, or he gets the call, he takes a job. Is he the one that should be calling the listing agent 
the buyer's agent uh, and setting up all the appointments before uh, the inspection? Or is this something that he works with a buyer's agent and she works with this, the listing agent? So um, this is, again, going to be a little bit different state to state. So you, you need to sort of look at the process that you have in those areas. The first question is, who's hiring you? If it's a pre-inspection, it's for the seller. So you're just going to coordinate with the seller. If it's a pre-inspection for the buyer, then you're going to need to coordinate with the buyer through the buyer broker, and then they're going to have to go through and get a hold of the listing broker to set up the time for you to do that. Um, one of the things that I, I am teaching is that the listing brokers should actually, if the buyer is hiring the inspector, the listing broker should not be the one who is on site and they should not be the one who's opening the door for you. Um, in a lot of states where you guys are licensed, you actually have lockbox access and that's great. It saves everybody a lot of time, but then the consumer should not be in the home without one of the brokers being there and it should be the buyer's broker or, or whichever side of the transaction hired you, um, that broker should be the one that's there and on site. When I do have buyer brokers there, I also, and, and when I'm again teaching this class, I always remind them, please do not follow the inspector around. Please do not point things out to them. You can do that when you first get there, say, hey, here's some things they saw and just get the hell out of the way. Let you guys do your job without distraction. You know, I, like, I don't need to follow you around, but like, oh, did you see that? Because it's gonna drive you crazy. And inevitably me interfering with you is going to have you miss something. And that's not good for any of us. So, you know, I, I tell the brokers I'm working with, like. You just be present in the home. That way, if they need access into a room or if there's a question about something, you know, they can come and find you. But otherwise, like do your Facebook post, go on Tinder and find a date. I don't care. Just stay out of their way. Just let you guys do what you're going to do. Good. Thank you. We had that discussion going on here in Texas on our Facebook page. So good information. Is there anyone else that has a question or that would like to um uh, Say something. All right, John, it was a great class. Lots of wonderful information. We appreciate that for sure. And we have uh, recorded the, the presentation. So we will have that if someone wants to go back and gather some of the information or hear your answers uh, when they're taking it a little bit slower and they can understand. Uh, and I know you must see these. People are saying thank you. Uh, yeah. Awesome information. So again, yeah, real quick, Brenda, uh, one of the folks did ask a quick question. You're saying, how do you politely tell the, the seller's agent to get out of the way? And that could be the seller being present um, because they want to engage you. They want, they might, they might purposely be trying to distract you or purposely trying to show you things to like add value to it. Um, I'm pretty upfront. Again, this is where you need to work with the broker to have them like be really clear and sending the expectations so that you're not the one having to engage that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's you guys are kind of like the coach at a at like a little kid's baseball game where you or soccer game where you have to be the one telling the obnoxious parent on the sideline to sit down and be quiet so you can do your job. Um, that's a personality thing. You've got to find a way to effectively do that. Um, and, and the best way that I have found and the best thing that I've heard from an inspector is to say, you know, I really appreciate this. If you want to do a quick walkthrough with me now and point anything out, let's go and get that out of the way. That way, you know, I have a format I follow. And if I, and if I get distracted, I don't want to miss something that creates liability for you or your client for not, you know, for me missing that. So let's go ahead and get your part out of the way now. And then I'll focus on what I need to do on my own without distraction. I think that's what we do as well, John, just you talk with them about their concerns right up front and then ask them to allow you to go through the house. You'll sit back down with them and go through everything that you found and answer questions when you finish. Yep, so, yeah. exactly. All right, class, thank you so much for being there. Now is the time for me to do that drawing for the, now that you've had a home inspection, let's see what we've got. And if you're the winner, if I may ask you to go immediately to the chat box and put your email address so that we can get this information out to you. All right, Joshua Croquette, you are the winner. So if you don't mind, send me that email address right away. So Brenda, uh, real quick, we had one more, another question that came up in the Q&A. Um, speaking of access, I hold a Century Key Access. Most realtors love it. Had one who was upset about me popping, um, popping door open. 
that should not have been done without the realtor present. What's your position on that? Um, and it was, so in a lot of associations, um, the, the, the inspectors do or are provided, especially if you're licensed and you're bonded and insured, like you're going through the process, you guys uh, will have lockbox access. What we remember is that any access, anytime we use that, it always, always has to be scheduled and approved by the seller. So I struggle because I have a lot of folks that will call the buyer broker. And if the buyer broker doesn't set it up and confirm it, it's an issue. I don't have a problem with an inspector calling me directly as a listing broker, scheduling it with me. And then I have the opportunity to say, but if the buyers are going to be present, the buyer's broker has to be there with you. Um, otherwise, and, and in some states, you guys are not allowed to be there because if you're not licensed, a lot of states do not allow inspectors to be there without the buyer broker being present or a broker being present. So you still have to sort of, uh, sort of look at that aspect of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, if there's a, what, what I'd say is um, if you look at NER ethics, there's actually a separate part of that, that, that word that we do as newer brokers called pathways to professionalism. And it goes through that, but when you're, but you can also reach out to the MLSs. And this is something that we don't usually have inspectors talk about, but go to the MLS, go to the board, whoever actually provides the lock boxes, visit with them about what the rules are for who can be present, how that works, what are the processes for scheduling showings or inspections, um, and what happens if a consumer shows up, what happens if you get there and there's something weird. Um, and then I would take that and again, do a little video segment on one of your social media sites, push it out there. And then you can be the educator for brokers on what they're going to now expect from their inspectors. So you can set the bar and really create those changes that you want to do for your whole industry by having it pushed by us. So again, just a lot of different ways of, of approaching things.